We're going to dig into the Bible. We call this series, This is the Bible. And I hope you understand that at the center of the Bible and in the center of Christianity is a person, and his name is Jesus. Let's try it again, because like half of you said that. The center of the Bible and the center of Christianity is a person, and his name is Jesus. 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 And so when you, when you study Jesus, when we get into the Word of God and we study Him, what we end up finding out are there's some principles and there's people when we're studying the Word, right? All around Jesus, there are principles that He gives and there are people that surround the whole story of Jesus. And the principles are the wisdom. Jesus gives us wisdom and revelation. And there's people that actually we see that that he actually came after Jesus and their stories actually, they, they changed history too. There are history-changing people that are followers of Jesus. Amen? Anybody? I mean, that's you too, right? Amen? But tonight, we want to look at somebody that, that many would call possibly uh, one of the all-stars in Christianity. But we're going to go back to his origins, if you will, for when he, he actually got saved in the things that followed right after that. So tonight, we're going to look at Saul... And his testimony. Saul and his testimony. Now notice I didn't say biography. There's a difference between a biography and a testimony. Now here's the thing in our culture today, I think you would agree with me, that people are fascinated with a biography. People are fascinated with a true story. Right? Don't you love saying that to somebody if you tell them something? But guess what? It was a true story. They're like, whoa, that was a good story, but now it's next level story, right? And so these biographies, people get, get fascinated by them because they, they tell stories of overcomers and people who stood firm, who, 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 who had everything going against them, and, and they won. But there's a difference between a biography and a testimony. Do you know what it is? I will tell you, the difference between a biography and a testimony is God. You know that? See, a biography is what somebody did. Biography is somebody who won something. Biography is about their glory. But a testimony is about what God did. It's about him winning. And it's about his glory. It's a big difference. So as Christians, our goal shouldn't be to leave behind a biography, but to create a powerful testimony. So our goal, all of us in here, your goal should not be, I'm going to leave a really good biography. No, it should be to leave powerful testimonies, plural. Yeah, you remember, you don't just have a testimony. I got lots of testimonies. Amen? Come on, somebody. God has done a lot of things in my life, and he has been faithful. So I can give you my testimony of when I got saved, but I can give you lots of testimonies of the faithful and goodness of God. Amen? Right? So all of chapter 9, as we, we read a little bit in it back in May, as we're getting caught back up, uh, is the testimony of Saul converting to Paul. So tonight, you know, I want you to ask yourself, am I living for a biography or a testimony? Ask yourself that question. Am I living for a biography or a testimony? Am I living for people to be impressed by Jesus or people to be impressed by me? So I'm going to ask you several questions tonight, and they're going to be personal questions for you to reflect on, and I want you to think about these questions. It's going to help you understand and answer the question, am I living for a biography or a testimony? Okay? It's important. Why is this important? Good question. Because a testimony builds up the faith of believers and it draws in unbelievers. That's what a testimony does. You know it. When someone shares their testimony, don't you, doesn't your faith go up? Right? I don't know about you, but back when I was a non-believer, I was hearing testimonies and I'm like, Jesus did what? I didn't know about no Jesus doing that. And that's one of my favorite things when our staff gets together and we share weekly testimonies. It's amazing to hear what's going on in your all's lives, the things that we're hearing about what God's doing in your lives and, and things that God's doing in our lives. It, it, it's, it's amazing how much your faith can be built up whenever you hear what God's doing. Why? Because we're believing God to do something big. And when you hear him do something get big, you'll believe, him, you'll believe he'll do something even bigger than that, right? 
Or if he'll do it, if he'll do it for you, he'll do it for me, right? right? So we, we have to be people who have testimonies and we're sharing our testimonies. But there's many people who don't understand the power of their testimony. They discount their testimony. But don't forget Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they defeated him, the enemy, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. So to, to defeat the enemy, to defeat Satan, it's the blood of the lamb, right? That's Jesus doing his work on the cross. And what else? And it wasn't or, it was and. You see that? It's powerful because it shows, number one, that God is alive and number two, God is still working. God is alive and God is still working. Every time I hear a testimony, my faith goes up because I see God still moving and he is alive, right? And then you, as you're sharing your testimony, you become a living letter from God to other people. You become a living story of God's grace, put it that way. Isn't that awesome? So here's question number one that you need to reflect on tonight. What were you like as a non-Christian? What were you like B.C., before Christ? Before you knew Jesus, before you gave your life to Christ, what were you like? Were you uh, rebellious? You don't have to raise your hand. Did you kind of go your own way, kind of do your own thing, right? Right? thinking you got it all figured out? Is it, are there some things that were going on in your life before you knew Christ that you wouldn't want us to put up on the screen up here in front of everybody, right? So listen, Saul, before he knew Jesus, Saul was ruthless. Saul was religious, and Saul was rigid. Hope you understand, if y'all don't know anything about Saul, but Saul hated Christians. Hate, hate, hate might not even be a strong enough word. In fact, he was public enemy number one to Christianity, was Saul. The equivalent in our day today would be a terrorist who was out to kill all the Christians. That would be Saul. Think about it. He killed Stephen. Y'all remember that? He chases after Christians. He's literally grabbing grandma and grandpa's wives, children, and standing and watching people be killed. He hates Jesus. How about you? What were you like, B.C., before you knew Jesus? Were you on Team Jesus? No, you weren't. So you were against Jesus. Question number two, how did your, your view of Jesus change? How did your view of Jesus change? B.C., I will say this. B.C., before Jesus, before I knew Christ, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like everything's going pretty good for a while. Kind of got things figured out. I'm a good person. I do some good things every now and then. I don't get angry too much. I mean, I'm not impatient too much. I'm not as bad as that person over there, right? Somebody might, ask, might have asked me before I knew Jesus, um, is Jesus God? I'd be like, well, I, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. Is he your Lord? Nope. Nope. Do you live for him? Nope. So what, what changed your view? Because when, when, when I talk to non-Christians, um, one of the questions I like to ask them is, what's your view of Jesus? It's a good question if, you, if you're ever talking with a non-Christian. What's your view of, Christian, uh, of, of Jesus? And then when you talk to a Christian or someone who says they're a Christian, how did your view of Jesus change? Ask them that question. See, Saul thought Jesus was a blasphemer. And he really thought Jesus was the most ungodly person who ever lived. And that's why he hated Jesus. And that's why he hated Christians. But then he had an encounter with Jesus in Acts chapter 9. We read about it in verses 1 all the way through 18. He got saved. He was baptized. It's kind of like starting a new job. 
You ever been there before? Where you left a job, you found this brand new one, you're like, what is going on? You got all this new jargon. I can't figure all this. I got to wear a new uniform. Everything's different right now. And then Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This means that anybody who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So Saul goes from breathing threats, anger, bitterness, all of that is gone. Why? Because he's a new creation. He's a new creation. And after Ananias met with him, in verse 19, we read this. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. He stayed with the believers for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is indeed the son of God. Now, again, notice in verse 20. And he immediately, immediately began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying he is indeed the son of God. Immediately. Why do I keep saying that? Immediately. See, when you're truly saved, you don't waste time to tell people about Jesus. You're always looking for opportunities if you truly are saved and your view of Jesus has changed. Notice also, in the synagogues, in the synagogues, the same guy who used to go to the synagogues for a different reason. The same guy who preached against Christians is now preaching for Christianity. And here's the point. Don't miss this. This is, this is so good. This is, this is so how God works. God never wastes anything. God never wastes anything. Don't ever look at your life and go, well, I don't know why I had to go through this. I don't know why God had me have this job over here for so long, but now I'm over here and now I don't understand why I had to go through that. God will use it if you allow him to. Who better to go into the synagogue than Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee of Pharisees, who would have had, if not all the Old Testament, most of it memorized, to walk in there to them and say, you know who this is all about? We've all been studying about. we memorized all these scriptures. I met him. And I fell to my knees. And his name is Jesus. See, God doesn't waste anything. Anything. Many people that I've met over the years, when they allow God to use what, what he's, what the, whatever you've done in your past, what has ever happened in your past, there are ministries around you. God has taken you through stuff to speak to people of places where you've been, right? Look at verse 21. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? Let me ask you a quick question. Be, you know, not BC, but after you've known Jesus? You ever anybody asked you that question before? Like, who are you? Anyway, am I the only one? I mean, when I got saved and I gave my life to Jesus, it was just one after another. And a lot of them didn't want to, didn't want to be my friend anymore. But I didn't care. I met Jesus. Nothing matters after you've met Jesus. When I found out who Jesus really was in the truth, I didn't care if people didn't like me. Guess what? I still don't care if people don't like it. I don't. Because I met Jesus. He's changed my life, right? The point is, when you, when you truly have met him and you change your view about whatever you thought he was and it was wrong into the truth of who he is, and people ask, who are you? You tell him, I'm a follower of Christ. He's changed my life. And you don't care if they make fun of you or talk about you or whatever. You don't care. Because you met Jesus. Verse 22, Saul's preaching became more and more powerful. And the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. A couple of things to point out here in this, this verse. Don't miss this. Saul's preaching became, it became more and more powerful. Why do I point that out? It became more and more powerful. 
The point is this. Following Jesus and getting closer to him and growing in your faith is a process. It didn't say Paul got saved and he was the most powerful preacher on the planet in that very moment. His preaching became more and more powerful. It became. It's a process. So whether you're at, I don't know where you're at today, and you might be thinking, you know, I, I, I kind of got this kind of gift, and I feel like the Lord wants to use me this way, but I'm not really good at it. Well, if you lean into it, and if you let God grow it in you, it's a process, and it can get greater. It can expand. God can expand your ministry. You know you have a ministry? You know that? Every one of you in here, if you're a Christian, you have a ministry, right? And God can actually expand that and use everything. If you allow him to grow it, you've got to give it to him, right? Also interesting, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it. It's an interesting thing. Um, th there's a Greek word here, and it's used also in chapter 2. Do you guys remember what happened in chapter 2? Anybody remember what happened in chapter 2? I bet you do. Holy Spirit came down, and they spoke in tongues. And there's a word that, that we used to describe the people that saw what was going on. And we often translate it, your Bible might say this, is bewildered, perplexed, confused. They didn't know what was going on. And that's kind of the same word being used here. They, they couldn't refute his proofs. Like they're, they're, they're like, they're amazed, they're bewildered, they're like, what? It's the same idea. So, so think about that word and what they felt in Acts chapter 2 when they saw all of these believers are speaking in different languages. And they're, they're in, in that particular language, they're praising God in a language they don't even know how to speak. And they're going, what is happening? This is the same thing. They're going, this guy was literally killing Christians. It's the same bewilderment that's happening, okay? Now, again, his proofs. What proofs would he have? This guy was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. That's why they're blown away. Now, if it had been like, you know, just Joe Schmo walking up in the synagogue, they'd be like, get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. But Saul walks in here and they're going, that makes sense. I don't like that it makes sense. And how did this happen again? Like, how are you? Why, what happened? You're Saul. Like, this, this should not be this way. Are we taking crazy pills? What is happening right now? Right? So another thing, notice here. We, 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 we have just learned that Saul's view of Jesus, he actually has two different titles. We're going to see that. He knows him as Son of God and the Messiah. Son of God and Messiah. He is indeed the Son of God, and he's showing proofs that Jesus is the Messiah. Those are the two things you're going to see. Now, those are titles that he's giving to Jesus. Now, titles today, we use titles a little bit differently uh, than they did, and other cultures do it a little differently. Like, for instance, okay, um, today, in another country, let's just say another country uh, that's ruled by a royal family, okay, um, there might be somebody that has the title of prince, Okay, in another country, okay? Now, that, that can mean a lot of things, right, for a royal family. What's a prince? What, you know, what authority do they have? Yada, yada, yada. See, like, in America, when we say prince, we just think of purple rain. Like, if, if that's all it means. That's, it, does, it doesn't, it, it was true. That's true. That's true. Uh -huh. So, we need to ask when Saul, when Paul is referring to Jesus as Son of God and Messiah, we need to know what do these titles mean when he says this, and, and, and why did he use these specific titles when he's talking about Jesus? So what he's doing is he's declaring and claiming because his view of Jesus has changed. You see that? So when your view of Jesus changes, you call him something different than you did before. Right? So son of God. So why, why does he say son of God? Now for us, 
again, it might mean some, we might think that means something different, or I've heard people say, well, does that mean he's like less than God, whatever? No, that's not. Back then, they would have totally understood what son of, when someone's a son of someone, and, and, and that's actually how they named a lot of their kids, right? Like you hear like Jack's son, like, that, that, like they, they have the same identity. So they would hear son of God, and they would have known when someone says he's the son of God, that he is identifying with God. That he is God. They have the same identity, right? They would also know when he said son of God, there's, he, he's saying that he's perfect because only God could be perfect, right? So they, they knew when he was saying it. And that's why a lot of them got mad two different times in the Gospels where Jesus said he would, called himself the son of God. They called him a blasphemer, right? So it, again, son of God. And if that's hard for you to understand, just think of um, the little phrase that we always say, like father, like son, right? Same, same identity. And they would all know that. John chapter 14, verse 7, Jesus said this, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. We're one and the same. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. So he's like, okay, well, show us God then. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? We are the same. It's a mystery, three in one, but we are the same. He's saying that God and I are equal. We are one, same authority. I am God. That's what Jesus is saying, okay? John chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made. Nothing. All things were made through Him, and the Word was God. So there's the first title, Son of God. Number the second one, the Messiah. What's that mean? The Messiah means the Christ, the anointed one, the holy one, the one that was prophesied about, the one we've been waiting in anticipation for, the one who's going to come in power, right? Let me ask you this question. Whenever you met Jesus, did you go from he's a good man to he's the God man? Did you go from he's He's, he's, a, he's a good example of what we should be like, or he's the exact representation of God. And this is the way you know if somebody truly is a Christian. You ask them, what do you think about Jesus? Ask someone that. What do you think about Jesus? And the answer should be, he's the son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's God. He's the Savior. That's what it should be. And then you can ask them this, a follow-up question. How did your view of Jesus change? Let me tell you something. If you ask someone who says they're a Christian and you you ask them, how did your your view of Jesus change? And they say, well, it really hasn't. It's probably because they haven't met him. Okay? Now, quick note here. What Saul is saying, you you need to understand the weight of what he's saying. When he calls Jesus son of God and he calls him the Messiah, at that time would have been seen as radical for him to say this. It's true because he's just echoing what Jesus already said. And sometimes uninformed believers and uninformed non-believers will say, well, you know, Jesus never claimed that he was God. He never did that. And I just say, well, you don't read your Bible or you need to get one. It's Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. But Jesus kept silent. You might know this one. And the high priest answered him and and, and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Pause for a second. Y'all know I've I've said this a couple of times. This is just a joke. It's got to be repeated every time. It's just too funny. He has Jesus. It's like putting Jesus, Jesus, put your hand on the Bible. And repeat after me. (laughs) I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth. Nothing but the truth. So help me. So help me. But but anyway, he says, he says, tell, tell, it's funny every time. He He said, he said, tell us if you are the Christ, 
the Son of God. You see that? Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Meaning, yes, that is true, what you just said. I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. Nevertheless, or in addition to that, I'll say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man, which is another name going all the way back to Daniel, the name of Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further do we need? Have of witnesses. Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. Now, what's blasphemy? Blasphemy is this, is when somebody says they're God and they're not. It would be like if you go tomorrow morning and you have coffee with your best friend and they lean in and say, hey, I got to tell you something. I haven't told anybody this, but I'm God. (laughs) And you, you would be like, is there anything in your coffee besides just coffee? Like, are you... What did you do before you got here? Um, do we need to go to the hospital? Are you okay? Right? And that would be blasphemy, right? That'd be wrong. And so the charge they're giving Jesus here is, you say you're God. We're giving you an, an, an opportunity to recant what you said. And if you don't, you are going to die. So don't miss this. The issue that they had with Jesus was not that he helped the poor. They didn't have any problem with that. They, didn't really, they weren't like, Jesus, stop helping the poor people. That's not, not, that didn't happen. The issue wasn't even that he ate with sinners. They didn't like that, but that wasn't why they killed him, right? The issue wasn't that he did good deeds, that he did good things. That's not why they killed him. They killed him because he said, I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. I am the anointed one. I came to take away the sin of the world for those who put their faith in me. Jesus claimed to be God. This was not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. Let me say it again. Jesus claimed to be God. That was not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. So, Christians must claim that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. Every Christian, if you're a Christian in here today, a follower of Christ, you must, it's mandatory that you claim Jesus is the Son of God and he is the Messiah. Someone asks you, who is Jesus? What's your view of Jesus? He's the Son of God and he's the Messiah. Hands down. Hands down. Next question. What does time alone with Jesus look like for you? What does time alone with Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, what does that look like for you? Verse 23. After a while, underline that, after a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. After a while, or maybe your Bible might say many days. After many days. I don't know what your, which translation you have. After a while or many days. I know you, need to just, you might have a note or something, maybe in the footnote. I don't know if, you, if your Bible has all that. But there is a, 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 a large gap between uh, verse 22 and 23. Okay? After a while equals three years. Okay, so you might want to write that one down. Now, if I told you I went somewhere for a while, I, didn't, I usually don't mean three years. But, I mean, that's what it means here. After a while or many days, three years worth of days <laughs> gone by, how do we know that? Good question. Paul talked about it in Galatians chapter 1. Let me read it to you. He says this, Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received my message from no human source and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. When did he get that? On the road to Damascus. Remember that? Okay, verse 13, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how violently persecuted, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. 
But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with other human beings, no, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away to Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. That's how we know. There's a gap there between verse 22 and 23. So three years, Saul says, I met Jesus, my mind was changed, Scales came off my eyes. My view of Jesus changed. I went out. I talked about Jesus, started preaching, and God then led me into solitude. God led him into solitude after that. Why did God lead Paul into solitude after that? We'll find this oftentimes when, when someone gets saved and God's got a call in their life and they've truly surrendered to Jesus. God will sometimes lead you into a season of solitude to, uh, for study, for you to study the Word of God, uh, for you to learn, uh, for you to grow, for you to grow in patience, and for you to trust God and obey Him, right? Before He'll let you out and, and put you into the calling, the full calling that God has on your life. And so notice, He directed Him into the desert. Who else was led into the desert? Jesus, for a time of preparation, right? Now, Jesus was laid in the desert 40 days. Paul had three years. If I'm being honest about me, mine was a lot of years. I got saved, gave my life to Jesus, and years went by before I stepped into my calling that I'm in today. A lot of it was me. A lot of it was fear. Uh, a lot of it was being stubborn. Um, a lot of it was immaturity. A, a lot of it, honestly, was um, learning that God's ways are higher than my ways and trusting that he had a plan that's higher than my plan. But I found that God will oftentimes, he'll, he'll take those that, that want to be his servants, that really want to follow him, and he'll take you into a season of solitude like Moses right? Many of the prophets, John the Baptist, right? Now, I want you to notice this. There's a difference between solitude and isolation, okay? Two different things. Solitude is when I get away to draw close to God, which is what Jesus would do, right? Jesus would, would get away from the crowds in solitude with the Lord. Isolation is I run away from everybody and the Lord, right? That's a bad place, I hide. That's what isolation is. And the enemy wants you to isolate yourself from God. And we're not called to isolate. We should not isolate. But we do need times of solitude. We need time for prayer, for reading our Bibles, for journaling, processing, surrendering to God, repentance, serving, singing. Come on, somebody. See, too many Christians, they get on fire for the Lord and they desire a position for God, but they don't want his presence. Let me tell you something, God's not going to give you that position if you don't desire his presence first. Right? And if you don't desire his presence first, are you really saved? Because see, when we're in his presence, that's when we can receive direction. So if you want to know which direction I'm supposed to go, you've got to be in his presence. Not God put me in this position. Give me this authority and then I'll do X, Y, Z. No, 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 no. You're not God. You get on your knees, you get into his presence, and you listen to the Lord. Let him guide and direct you. And when we, and we live like this, when, when we want a position and we want to be liked, and that's really all that we really want, it causes these three things to happen. Hurry, worry, and busy. Hurry, worry, and busy. I call this the false trinity. Hurry, worry, and busy. You live a life, you just hurried, we got all this stuff, you know, I got to get to this, to that. Man, you're going too slow, you know, da, da, da. And then worry, like, what's going to happen? I don't know. And busy again, you just fill up your schedule, you say yes to everything, just da, 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 da. And you don't have time to get in God's presence, or you don't prioritize getting in God's presence. And when you're hurried, you're worried, and you're busy, you're all about yourself. You know that? That's a selfish way to live. Hurried, worried. And busy. Let me put it to you this way. If you're too busy for the Lord, it's time to reassess your priorities. 
If you are too busy for the presence of God, it's time to reassess your priorities. If, let me say, if you're too busy for the Lord, could it be, could it be, possibly, that when you pull your cell phone out, there's actually a name on it, and it says the Lord on your cell phone, because that's your Lord. Could it be? I don't know. Could it be? Here's the thing. Technology can either draw us closer to the Lord or create distance between us. And the sad thing is, even Christians, there are some people, and I, you know, they call themselves Christians, some people, they go to technology first and social media first for direction and guidance instead of the presence of the Lord. So my question to you again is, what does your time alone with Jesus look like? It's important for us to spend time in solitude. And I would say often, often. And then when you're, when you're getting into the presence of the Lord and you're submitting to his guidance and his word, you should also submit to spiritual authority and leadership. We need that too. You need godly counsel. The opposite of that is I want to do this at the church. I want to sing. I want to lead. I want to teach. I want to do this. And they're usually really visible positions. I want to be seen by everybody else, right? And that should be a red flag. If you feel that in your spirit boiling up that you want to be seen and you want to be seen as important, that should be a red flag. And typically, if that, if that happens to you, and if you're a new believer, you know, don't, it's not condemnation, but that should be a red flag of some immaturity, some spiritual immaturity, when I want it to be about me. And when I want things to be about me, it's because I'm not getting alone with him, right? See, maturity, spiritual maturity is seeking the low position, right? Don't seek high positions. I want the low position. I'll pick up the trash. I'll take out the trash. I'll stack the chairs. I'll do whatever it is necessary. I don't care if anybody ever sees it. Like, that's spiritual maturity, right? So, I'll say this too, to, to help some people out. If, if you're a new believer, and, and perhaps maybe you struggle with that, you, you, you really want to be seen, you, you really you want to have a position, you really want that, look, that, that kind of immaturity, that you, if you struggle with that, I want you to know this. You didn't see everybody else who's in those positions. You, you didn't see their seasons of solitude. You didn't see the years that they spent alone with the Lord stacking chairs and just being obedient to what God called them to do, right? You didn't see the years that, that they weren't up there, right? You didn't see all the years that everybody else was getting opportunities, and they didn't, but they were like, you know what, Lord, well, I'll do whatever it is you want me to do, right? Just use me. Just use me. Any way you want me to, Lord, right? So, again, it, it's about your posture. That's really what spiritual maturity is all about, is the posture. So it requires humbleness. So the question again, what does time alone with Jesus look like for you, and how often are you spending time in solitude? Okay. Next question. How have you suffered for Christ? How have you suffered for Christ? Again, we're talking about the difference between a biography and a testimony. How have you suffered for Christ? Saul, listen, Saul caused suffering on Christians. Now he's going to suffer for being a Christian. Here, here, here's the point. I hope you all know this. Part of being a Christian is experiencing Suffering. You know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we don't want to amen that, but you know, that, that's just part of following Jesus, right? Um, so let's go back to verse 23. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. To kill him. Ananias told Saul, Paul, about this, if you guys remember. They, they, they're plotting to kill him. They were plotting with him before he knew Jesus. Now they're plotting to kill him because he's with Jesus. Verse 24, they were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they can murder him, right? 
But Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall, the city wall. I don't know about you, but uh, that'd be kind of embarrassing. Just a little bit embarrassing, right? Wouldn't it be? Like you, you would want to tell your grandkids one day, like they were, they were coming after me. They're coming to kill me. And then I, they're like, what'd you do, Grandpa? Did you fight them? No. I snuck out in a waste basket in a trash can and a hole in the wall. But I'm here. Anyway, I don't know. This is the plan now is to run away and go to the Christians. But, verse 26, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with other believers. Notice he tried. Must have meant it was difficult. Right? He kept trying to meet with them, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. And you might immediately think, well, that's a little harsh. They were afraid of him. They wouldn't let him be part of the group. They weren't being tolerant. Why weren't they doing that? Uh, here's the way I think about it. What if you knew a murderer of Christians, someone who hated Christians, moved in next door to you in your neighborhood, hated Christians with a passion, and they're like, knock, 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 knock. I want to be part of your life group tonight. What would you do? Some of y'all are like, nah, do, do. don't answer the door. Don't answer the door. Don't answer the door. Turn the lights out. Nobody's here. No, there's nothing. They did not believe. Again, it says they did not believe. Which is like, it's kind of a little sad because he's like a guy without a home. And I want you to know, if, if you're a new believer, that's what it feels like at the beginning. Like you had all these friends. You had all these people you hung out with. And then all of a sudden, now they don't want to be around you because you're going to follow Jesus now. And you got to find a whole new group of friends. And you're kind of in that middle part where you're like, Nobody wants to hang out with me. Nobody likes me. But here's the, here's the point, though. We, we can't miss in this. We often disqualify people from the kingdom because we don't know their past mistakes. Because we do know them. We know their past. We know what they did in the past. And then we're like, no, like, that can't be right. I, can't, I, can't, I know what you did. Like, I, know, I know the person that you were. And why do we have a problem with that? Because it's hard to believe in the change if, if it's somebody who's been your enemy. Do you know that? Somebody, somebody who, who, who has been, who's wronged you, who's, who's wronged your family, and then all of a sudden they become a Christian. Think about somebody that's wronged you and your family out there. And all of a sudden, let's just say this Sunday, they come sit next to you, right next to you. You'd be like, go sit somewhere else, you know, you know. But here's the reason why. The, the, the reason we instinctively doubt change in others is because we know how hard it is for us to change. Like you know you. You know how hard it is for you to change. And therefore, you doubt the change in somebody else. Right? I remember that being a new Christian. I had some people that I thought were really good friends of mine and I sat down with them, and I would tell them about what Christ has done in my life. And I'm not the same, and I'm never going back. And they would just look at me like, you're weird. Like, I don't, what? No. No, 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 no. No, no, there's no way. You, there's no way. There's no way. Yeah. Yeah. And so... When you become a Christian, you can have suffering on both sides, right? You can have people that used to know you that are not Christians persecute you. Then you can have people that are Christians who are really religious start to persecute you. Like, we don't want to be around you because we know who you were, right? Like, I pray that's never our church. So I'm going to skip down a little bit here just for a second time. Um, Next question. This will be my last question. Yeah, I'll get you this last question here. When we're talking about a biography versus a testimony, let's skip down to this question. What role does church community play in your life? What role does church community play in your life? The body of Christ. 
the family of God. Because when you're a Christian, you, you become grafted in, right? You become grafted into a brand new body. And, and when, you, when you're in the body of Christ, that's where we grow spiritually. And that's why you are here tonight, right? Because you want to grow spiritually. And it's awesome, right? So let's go back and read verse 26 again. Don't miss this. When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. That's verse 26. Look at verse 28. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Did you catch it? Verse 26. He tried to meet with them. They're afraid of him. They told him to get out. Verse 28, Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Verse 26, no. Verse 28, we're bros. How do we go from no to bros? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Verse 27 happened. Verse 27. And that was really deep theologically. <laughs> Verse 27, then Barnabas, everybody say Barnabas. Barnabas. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles. So now Saul has a new circle. They wouldn't let him in. But Barnabas spoke up for him. Did you know Barnabas, the actual name means son of encouragement? Son of encouragement. And we saw that, if you guys remember, when, we, when we, we looked a little bit about Barnabas, very generous, encouraging. That was a spiritual gift. I don't know about you, but I'm, when I'm around somebody who has the spiritual gift of encouragement, I like that person. Amen? Come on, somebody. Amen? I love being around somebody like that. Typically, if things aren't going very well, that's the person you call first. Amen? Come on, you know, right? Here's the point. You need a Barnabas. You need a Barnabas in your life. Now, let me clarify that. You need a Barnabas who will challenge you, but also speak up for you, right? We, we need somebody, not, not that they're just going, you're, you're amazing, you're just amazing. There's nothing that you do that is wrong. And you're, no, you don't need that. That's not Barnabas. But what we do need is we need someone that will challenge us, that you can get better and say, hey, look, I know they rejected you. Come with me. I'll, I, you don't want to go in there? I'm Barnabas. They know me. Come on. I'll speak up for you. You come with me in this group, right? I'll help you out. We all need a Barnabas. Question, do you have a Barnabas in your life? Next point, you should be a Barnabas for somebody else. You should. Every one of you in here need a Barnabas, which means Somebody next to you needs a Barnabas, and it could be you, right? <laughs> so who has God placed around you that might need a word of encouragement? Take a, take a step further. Who around you, just be honest with yourself, that you already know, they look to you for encouragement. Like they already call you, text you. They depend on you. For encouragement. If you already know there are people like that in your life, if you cut them off from that, you're cutting yourself from the call that God has on your life. He has put people in your path that need encouragement. You're supposed to be a Barnabas to some people around you. Every one of you in here, every single, you are not exempt from this. Well, I don't have the Barnabas anointing. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You can encourage somebody today, tonight, tomorrow, right? Now, I'll give you a quick warning, quick warning. Be careful of people who only encourage you your sin but can't handle your sanctification. you got to be very careful. There are some people, they just want you to keep on doing your old self, go back the old way, because they don't like the sanctification. They don't like the new you. They don't want you to go down that direction. They'll try to pull you back in the old ways. And somebody, that's a word for somebody here today. There's some people around you in your circle that don't need to be in your circle, Right? They're a square peg trying to fit in the circle, and you need to get them out, right? Verse 27, 
and told them how, here's what Barnabas did. He told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus. He is sharing Saul's testimony for him, right? Do you understand what kind of risk Barnabas is taking here? He's speaking up for Saul. They all knew who he was. That's real love. So he told him how Saul had seen the Lord on his way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. How the Lord had spoken to Saul. Now, I'm going to answer a question real quick. I get people ask me this all the time. How do I know if the Lord has spoken to me? How do, how do I know? Pastor Justin, like, sometimes I think it's me, but maybe it's, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's the Lord, but I don't know. You know it's the Holy Spirit. Like, I don't know. How do I know? Let me give you a couple quick things. Number one, you've constantly, consistently been praying. Remember, all the way back in verse 11, if you guys, you guys can go back to that after when you get home, Saul, Paul, Saul, was praying. Remember that? He was praying in solitude. So here's the point. A consistent daily prayer life proves you are being changed. Consistent daily prayer life, it proves that you are being changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're hearing from the Lord. Is you're aligning your heart and your will to his. Then he said this, and he also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. He's saying, yeah, the Saul who was killing anybody who talked about Jesus, now he's talking about Jesus. Here's the point. When you've truly changed, when you've been truly changed, there are some things you don't talk about anymore. They're just not. Because you don't desire that kind of vulgar conversation anymore, right? Right, men? When we follow Christ, there are some conversations. If, if, if I got an old friend or somebody who's not a Christian come up and they start talking about women or something, I just, I don't laugh. I don't, like, no, I don't talk about that. You don't have to be mean about it. I'm just not about that life anymore. It's amazing how many times I've had men come up to me over my life when I've done something like that and say, you know what, you know, a couple years ago we were at this thing and you were there and you said that, you know, it really bothered me. I got really mad at you. But then I got to thinking about it. I shouldn't be doing that. Convicting me. I have one guy that popped in my mind right now who got saved, got baptized after all that. Some guy that was a friend of mine, old friend of mine, and I just said something like that to him and then he... Met, it wasn't me. He met another guy and got in the church and da 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 and all that stuff. So my point is this. Just stand firm. Right? But I will tell you this. You will speak boldly about what you believe deeply. 100%. You will speak boldly. You are speaking boldly today about what you believe deeply. What are the things you spoke boldly about this week? The reason why you speak boldly about it is because you believe in it very deeply. If you went and saw a movie, and it was the best movie since Forrest Gump, that you're going to speak boldly about it. You're going to tell all your friends about it because you believe deeply in that, right? So if you're still having vulgar talk and gossiping about people, slandering other people, it's because you believe in that deeply, right? You need to repent. See, uh, someone who's truly given their life to Jesus, they, spoke, they speak be boldly about Jesus because they believe deeply. And they say, it doesn't matter what you think about me. I'm going to talk about Jesus. I'm not here to get your approval. I'm here to preach boldly, right? So you need a Barnabas. You need to be a Barnabas. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. Verse 28, so Saul stayed with the apostles. He went around to Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. And when the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. That's his hometown. So they helped Saul stay on the correct path, right? Verse 31, the church then had peace 
all throughout the, through the entire area, and it became stronger, it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. Underline that. In the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. So there was peace in the chaos because it got stronger in the fear of the Lord. And then they were encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And then it grew in numbers after that. Fear of the Lord, encouragement by the Holy Spirit, and then it grew in numbers. You see how that worked in that order? So let me close with this. Let me close with this. What can we learn from Paul's testimony? Because we just, we just come back. Sorry about that. That's my bad, Mike. My bad. Uh, that was on me. I just, my hand went down. Sorry about that. Uh, so what can we learn from Paul's testimony? Again, the, the whole night we've been looking at this, this, this initial testimony of Paul, okay? Three things real quick. Paul was chosen, yet he faced opposition. He was chosen, but he faced opposition. Number two, Paul was chosen, yet preparation, it took many years, many years before he stepped in the calling that God had in his life. He was chosen, and number three, yet he endured significant suffering, significant persecution, and this was just the beginning. Amen? <laughs> right. So Paul was chosen. He faced opposition. His preparation took a long time, and he had suffering. But here's the three things I want you to not forget when it comes to our testimony as believers. Number one, we don't live in fear of the world, right? Just like they did in the, in the, in the church. They did not, they, they don't live in fear of the world. Number two, we live in fear of the Lord. We're not scared of the world. We live in fear of the Lord. And number three, we live for a testimony, not a biography. We live for a testimony, meaning we live to point everyone to Christ, to what he's done in my life. I haven't done anything compared to what he's done. It's all about him. He won the victory, not me. I mean, I live from a victory. It's his victory. I didn't even have the victory. He did it, right? And it's not for my glory. It's for his glory. I do everything for him so people will know about him. Because of what he's done in my life. He's changed me. I'm not the same. So I'll speak boldly about what he's done. And so my testimony will always be Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus all the time. Nothing else. Nothing about me. I haven't done anything. And shame on me for trying to do a bunch of stuff to impress God. Right? That's not my testimony. My testimony is it's already done. It is finished. That's my testimony. That what he did on the cross was enough. His grace is enough. As bad as I was, his grace is enough. As far as I ran, his grace is enough. That's all I need is the blood of Jesus and the word of my testimony to defeat the enemy. So if you're a Christian, guess what? You've got the blood of Jesus. Are you ready to share your testimony? That's the question. The world needs Jesus. They need to be washed by the blood of Jesus. But they need to hear your testimony about what Jesus' blood has done for you. We have to be ready, ready. And every moment the word says, in every moment, every day, to give an account, to defend the word, to give your testimony. So I'm going to pray. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray something bold. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to. It seems to be a common theme with me, doesn't it? I just like... I think about stuff, and I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Like last week when I did the rap thing. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that right now. But I want to have it. I want to I pray something really bold over you. And um, if you're bold enough to accept it and pray it, pray it. And if you're not, that's okay. You can just let other people just stand in boldness in the Lord, okay? Um, yeah, Holy Spirit. I feel the Holy Spirit right now. Let's just pray this. 
Father, I need you to send me to places I've never been. Father, I need you to open my eyes to see people that I haven't been seeing. Father, I need you to point out people that are around me that maybe I've overlooked. God, I need you to to prompt me when there's somebody that's going to be in my path, maybe tonight, tomorrow, this week, that doesn't know you, that needs to know you, and needs to hear my testimony. God, I'm, I'm ready. God, wherever I go, tomorrow's Thursday. God, I don't know what. I got a couple meetings. I'm going to be here and there. But, Lord, I'm just praying right now, Father, that you would just, you would just highlight someone to me. Highlight a person to me, God, that you want me to share my testimony. I'm telling you right now, God, even if, even if I get really scared, I'm going to go. I will do it. I will go. I don't care if I'm at the gas station or if I'm at Walmart or whatever the restaurant, wherever I'm at, Father, I'm telling you right now, if you, if you will just prompt me, God, I will go. I will go and I will share. I am not afraid and I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So, Father, I submit my time to you. I want to be in your presence, but I want your presence to go with me as I leave here today. Guide me and direct me. Go ahead of me, God. Go ahead of me. Help me to see. Help me to see. Help me to see. God, I pray that you send somebody in my path right now, Father. I pray you send somebody in my path that is struggling, who's going through a terrible situation and they need a word of encouragement. God, I pray that you would, you would highlight somebody to me that, that, that needs my specific testimony, God. That they're going through something that I've already gone through, Father. I, I pray that you, you, you highlight somebody in my path tomorrow. I want to be used by you, Father. I want to speak boldly because I believe deeply. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for what you do in this church. Thank you for this church family that we get to do life together, God. But there are so many people that don't know you, God. They need to know freedom. They need to know freedom, real freedom, God. Use us. Use us. Use us. Guide us. Direct us. We submit to you. Holy Spirit, come. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ooh. Woo. Woo. I'm sorry. I'm kind of excited. Anybody else excited? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Yeah. All right. So we're going to end like this. I already prayed, but I'm just going to say this. When you leave here and God answers that prayer, please call me or text me and tell me. Give me, give me some testimony. Come on. And I'll tell you guys. Maybe we, just have, maybe we should do a whole service where we just share testimony of what God did. Amen? So th- let's get out there. Don't be afraid. Get ready. God will tell you what to say. One of y'all, I won't point to you, one of y'all in this room came to me many years ago, a couple years ago, and down the front, like, well, what if God, what if God shows me somebody and I don't know what to say? The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. I've done it, I've done it many times. Many, many times. It's scary. I know. It's scary. But it's amazing how if you just let you just take a deep breath, Holy Spirit, just give me the words, and just boom, the words just start coming. They're like, wow, that made sense. Like, boom, do, 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 you know what I'm saying? Sometimes I do it, and I, I'm like, that didn't make any sense. And they're like, you know what? I think I want to come to church on Sunday. I'm like, what in the world just happened? <laughs> that is crazy. I'm dead serious. Like, this happens all the time to me. But okay, so just want to encourage you. Don't be afraid. Be looking out. God will show you somebody. And go share, go share your testimony, okay? Okay? Love you guys. Thank you for being here tonight. Love you. Jesus is good.